the afternoon lectures. I don't see snaps. Okay. The philosophy of Martin Heidegger. <coughs> My great pleasure I today to, to introduce to you Professor you. Richard Capobianco of Stone Hill microphone. University. Use the there microphone. in Massachusetts, you have which to is suffering. Oh, the old, could you do that for me? I don't know. Red Sox fan from uh, the top it's just end of uh, Thomas M.C. After earning a BA in economics and philosophy from Hofstra University, Dr. Capobianco went on to Boston College, where he received both his master's and PhD. He wrote his dissertation under William Richardson, uh, one of the <coughs> great early uh, American scholars of Heidegger, um, but also had the great good fortune to study under Hans Georg Gadamer, who for a number of years uh, spent a semester after his retirement uh, teaching at Boston College. He then went to Stonehill College, uh, where he has taught for over 20 years. In 2000, he earned the college's Teaching Excellence Award and founded later then the college's honors program, of which he was the director for some 10 years. I guess it's for that reason that they punished him by making him uh, chairman of the Department <laughs> of Philosophy, um, which he is now. Uh, in 2010, so just over a year ago, uh, <coughs> Professor Capobianco published with the University of Toronto Press a book, Engaging Heidegger, an engaging title. Uh, he has also <coughs> published a number of articles um, on Lacan and Heidegger, The Ethics of Desire and the Ethics of Authenticity, Heidegger Caputo and the Ethical Question Revisited, Heidegger and Jung, and uh, Heidegger and the Gods on the Appropriation of a Religious Tradition, among others. He's translated two uh, relatively short uh, pieces uh, of Heidegger's and also uh, written a number of um, newspaper articles, popular pieces, uh, op-eds, uh, the title of one I, I'll read, No Cure for the Human Condition. Uh, I think that's supposed to be good news in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado then, let's please welcome Professor Richard Capobianco. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I understand from Holger, I just have to, is this better now? Yes. Everyone can hear? Very good. Well, uh, first off, I want to thank Dean McCarthy for very kind and generous uh, opening remarks. And I'd also like to thank um, Holger, Professor Zaborowski, who's been so very gracious from the very beginning and has been so very hospitable in the time that I've been here. It's really a pleasure and an honor to speak in this lecture series. A good friend of mine, Richard Velkley, who taught here for several years, uh, always spoke so very highly of this series and of the, the kinds of interesting engagement that speakers have with the audience. So I'm looking forward to that. So again, it's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. Well. One thing I should add, though, you, fear, you need not fear for my sanity because I'm not a Red Sox fan. <laughs> I was talking to Professor uh, Whipple, and uh, I grew up in New York, so I won't say what kind of fan I am, you might guess. Uh, so the Red Sox defeat is not very stinging at all. So I, I can't think clearly today. Well. Over the past several decades, Heidegger's thinking has been appropriated or expropriated, as it were, in a myriad of different ways. And all these various approaches testify to the extraordinary reach and richness of his thought. Even so, this afternoon, I'd like to bring us back to the core matter of his thinking. My teacher and mentor, Bill Richardson, tells a story and the late Manfred Frings, from whom I also learned a great deal, related to me a similar story. Bill Richardson uh, tells of the story of his visit with Heidegger in 1959. And at one point in their discussion, Heidegger 
gazing out the window of his study and contemplating the sloping wooded landscape, which I see there's no opportunity to do in this room here, uh, expressed his desire, his eagerness to say it yet again. But what was the it that Heidegger for a whole lifetime had his eyes upon? This it, the German S, that gives, gibt, so richly and so inexhaustibly is being itself, sein selbst in the German, as the temporal spatial, finite and negatived manifesting of beings in their beingness gathered in the ensemble. And, and I'll say more about this. But it's being as manifestness, the German Offenbarkeit, this is the matter itself, the core matter, which in Heidegger's work is often referred to as die Sache selbst, the core matter, the matter itself of Heidegger's thought, which remarkably enough is at risk of being forgotten all over again. A Seinsvergessenheit, another key word used by Heidegger, this forgottenness of being, is settling in anew. And in Heidegger's studies of all places, the core matter, not meaning or any comparable variation on this theme that would understand being in terms of Dasein sense-making, and this is a position that has recently been put forward very boldly by Thomas Sheehan, who's out at Stanford University and a good friend of mine, but he's been making uh, this case for quite some time now, among other Heidegger scholars, and, and others who would understand being in terms of Dasein's everyday uh, coping activity. And that's basically the position of Hubert Dreyfus at Berkeley and, and his many students who are all around the country now. And, and so it, it's the case that I'm making that it's not Dasein, but Sein, being, qua manifestation, in relation to Dasein's disclosedness, that is the core matter of Heidegger's thinking. You know, even uh, the distinguished Heidegger scholar Ted Kiesel, who will be here, I think, in just a few weeks, even he wishes to make the case that the core matter is Dasein, Dasein's factical throne existence. And I am suggesting it is not. It was and remained being qua manifestation. Now, in the 1960s, Heidegger repeatedly emphasized in his work and in his personal correspondence that it was the manifestness of being that guided his thinking from the start. There's a long story to be told here, but more to the point, in 1973, three years before his death, in a seminar with French colleagues in Zeringen, Heidegger made the observation that whereas Husserl was primarily influenced by the Brentano of the 1874 work Psychology from an Empirical Standpoint, he himself, from the very beginning of his Denkweg, had been propel propelled forward by Brentano's 1862 study on the manifold meaning of being in Aristotle, which of course Heidegger had also prominently mentioned in other places, including in the well-known preface to Bill Richardson's book. In the seminar, Heidegger added with a smile, as the protocol has it, but with emphasis, my Brentano is the Brentano of Aristotle. What Heidegger was pointing to was that in his view, Husserl, despite his breakthrough to the things themselves, and let us grant that there was indeed a break out of the Cartesian mind enclosure to the things themselves. I quite agree with Professor Sokolovsky's reading of Husserl there. Still, Husserl could not fully appreciate the proper character of the things themselves because he continued to address what we encounter from within the framework of a modern subjectism. That is, primarily from the side of the conscious subject. Heidegger's discomfort 
with Husserl's view is evident as far back as his 1919 lecture course given at Freiburg during the so-called war emergency semester, in which he began to take his distance from Husserl's phenomenological approach. Here Heidegger criticizes Husserl's reflective theoretical phenomenology for addressing the things that we encounter as inert objects appearing for and before the sense-giving eye or eye pole. But for Heidegger, what we encounter, what there is, as gift. He uses this in this 1919 lecture course very early on. Of course, it reappears again much, much later in his thinking, and very prominently so. But what there is has the character of an ereignis, a happening or an event within lived experience. And here he's employing his signature term, ereignis, for one of the first times. <clears throat> in other words, <clears throat> Things happen to us and address us in their significance. They are events of showing that we appropriate. Es weltet, he says, things world everywhere and always. Now, I speculate that with this expression, es weltet, Heidegger was tapping into the meaning of the old verb form, the old German verb form welten. We know the noun welt, world, but the verb form welten is very old and uh, no longer in use. But to world, which in the German, but more evidently in English, once conveyed this idea of to furnish and fill up with and to come into existence. So in other words, Things abound about us in their significance. But the important point is that in his reflections here, we detect that Heidegger very early on was inspired and guided by an exceptionally vivid sense of how things are manifest to us in an eventful way and address us and even speak to us, as it were. Especially notable is the poetic example he gives from Sophocles' Antigone, a very favorite text of Heidegger's, of just such a vibrant, resonant happening in our lived experience. The splendor of the rising and shining sun. That's the example he cites. And this is a perfect prefiguring of his reading in subsequent years of this Greek word phenomenon. Just, I think I can step away. Can you hear me? If I just write this on the board. <clears throat> this is a perfect prefiguring of his reading in subsequent years of this Greek word phenomenon in terms of finest thy, which ultimately derives, he says, from the Greek word phos, light. So things shining forth, manifestness. So even as early as 1919, we can discern, I think, that what truly interested and moved Heidegger was not so much that things are made present by us, Husserl's position, as that things present themselves to us. But it was Heidegger's study of Aristotle in those early years, culminating with his elucidation of metaphysics theta 10 on the on hos alethes, the being as true, that is truth as belonging most properly, reading Kyriotaton, to the being itself. <clears throat> and also his study of the Greeks more generally. And this confirmed his insight that to renew the question of being was to recover the experience of being as manifestive, 
as showing itself from itself, as unconcealing, as shining forth, as opening and offering itself, as addressing us and claiming us. This is the meaning of being that Heidegger sought after, even if originally this seeking worked itself out largely within a Husserlian phenomenological framework. But even in those early phenomenological years, let's say in the 1920s, the word meaning in that early formulation, the meaning of being, arguably served more as an indicator, a pointer, a marker, for his primary concern with the manifestness of being in relation to Dasein. Or that is certainly how the later Heidegger understood it. In 1946, in remarks to Jean Beaufre, who was Heidegger's um, French colleague and, and a very strong advocate of Heidegger's work, but in this first meeting with Beaufre in 1946, there is a little piece titled The Fundamental Question of Being Itself. And here Heidegger insisted, with that question concerning being, I have always and from the very beginning remained outside the philosophical position of Husserl in the sense of a transcendental philosophy of consciousness. Now that's quite a remarkable statement to make. And I think it's very instructive. But I do not think that it is a pejorative comment at all. I mean, it is simply Heidegger's realization some years later that what he had his eye on from the outset was very different from Husserl. That is, while Husserl was primarily concerned with clarifying the activity of making manifest from the side of consciousness, he had been chiefly concerned with being qua manifestation, insofar as being makes manifest Dasein in the first place, along with Dasein's activity of making manifest. Now, some years later in Lethor, in 1969, he explained further that already in being and time, meaning, here he uses the German word sin, did not have for him the sense of signification, bedeutung, as Husserl understood this in terms of sense-giving acts of consciousness. And he added, quote, being and time, does not attempt to present a new signification of being, but rather to open a hearing for the word of being, to let this hearing be claimed by being. In order to be the Da of Dasein, it is a matter of becoming claimed by being." Unquote. Now also at Lethor, he emphasized to the seminar members that in being in time, meaning, again, sin, was never intended to refer simply to a human performance or achievement. And he uses the word, the German word Leistung, which of course is central to Husserl's project. And Heidegger adds, <clears throat> thus, it was never intended to refer only to the structure of subjectivity. Rather, meaning is to be explained from, quote, the region of projection, which in turn is explained by understanding, which itself is to be understood only in the originary sense <clears throat> of Vorstehen, that is, quote, a standing before, residing before, holding oneself at an equal height with what one finds before oneself, and being strong enough to abide there. Unquote. In other words, his point is that meaning must be understood most properly as a response to being by Dasein and not as a performance or achievement, Leistung, of transcendental subjectivity. We might capture his position this way. 
Only insofar as there is being is there meaning. Now, nonetheless, his early talk about the meaning of being proved to be sufficiently problematical for him that he turned to the expression, the truth of being, in the 1930s, and also then to the place of being even later, but then back again to the meaning of being in the very late four seminars, which run the late 60s into the early 70s. But with that expression, the truth of being, he was indeed only drawing out more fully his own fundamental insight that had been there all along. Again, during the 1920s, he had repeatedly emphasized that the proper locus of truth is the being itself in its manifestness, and that we take part in the being's unconcealment, its truth. Those are his words. Seine Wahrheit, its truth, the being's truth. And for our purposes today, I'd like to focus on just one text to illustrate this point. It is from his 1928-29 winter semester lecture course, Introduction to Philosophy. And that's text number one that you have on the sheet. There are some more here on the side if you don't have it. <coughs> So I will read it along with you. Yet the manifestness of the being in itself, and, and I don't want to <clears throat> get lost in, in, in minutiae here, but, but as you all know, the language of a philosopher is so very important to that philosophical work. So I, I just call your attention here to Heidegger's words here. It's on ihm selbst. The being in itself, and I've translated it more literally as in it itself, on ihm selbst. Now what's interesting here is that he doesn't use the reflexive pronoun, sich. He could have simply said an sich selbst. He uses the personal pronoun ihm here. Now why is that? Well, one thing that immediately comes to mind, of course, is that he wants to be clear that he's not referring to the being in itself in any kind of Kantian or neo-Kantian way. And by using an sie here, uh, that could cause some confusion. It could be misleading. Or that he simply wants to emphatically state that the being in itself is not some unknowable thing in itself. The Kantian unknowable noumenon. No, no. The being in itself is, is manifest to us. And so he uses the personal pronoun here, I think, to emphasize that. Now later on, he even avoids the preposition on altogether, and he uh, uses the expression more, more generally, von sich hier, more, more explicitly, more emphatically, from itself. So the manifestness of the being from itself, forth. It's much more emphatic in, in some later texts. But even here in these early texts, I, I think the language gives us a good indication of how he wants to emphasize that it is the being itself that is true, that is showing itself, that is manifesting itself, that is presenting itself to us. So the manifestness, the being in itself, is made vividly clear to us if we describe this fact negatively and say, this being, as it is here in this context present at hand in itself, is not concealed to us as what it indeed could be. It is in it itself unconcealed. Because it is unconcealed in it itself, can we make propositions regarding it and also verify these propositions. The manifestness of the being is an unconcealedness, unverborgenheit. Of course, this is a very famous uh, Heideggerian expression. The manifestness of the being is an unconcealedness. 
Unconcealedness actually means in the Greek aletheia, which we customarily but inadequately translate as truth. True, that is, unconcealed, is the being itself. Thus, not the statement, not the proposition regarding the being, but the being itself is true. Only because the being itself is true can statements regarding the being be true in a derivative sense. Now, he also then says, in the tradition of metaphysics in the Middle Ages, there is, however, also a conception of truth veritas, according to which truth belongs to the being itself, to the ends. One thesis reads, omne ens est virum, every being is true. But this statement has an altogether different meaning, namely, that every being, insofar as it is, is created by God, but insofar as it is created by God, ens creatum, it must be thought by God. Insofar as it is thought by God, as the one who does not err, and who is the absolute truth, the being is true by virtue of being thought by God. Because every being is a created being, it is a being of a kind that is true, a virum qua cogitatum adeo, a true insofar as it is thought by God. Therefore, this concept of truth, of the being, rests on entirely different presuppositions from those in our exposition of truth. He wants to distinguish what he's saying here from this medieval view. Now, as I noted earlier, on this point Heidegger drew his inspiration from Aristotle, not Husserl, and specifically from Aristotle's metaphysics, theta 10 at 1051b. And it's a, admittedly a difficult text to decipher. Where Aristotle states that being is spoken of not only in terms of the categories and with respect to the potentiality and actuality of these, but also in the most proper sense, again, Heidegger reading Kyriotaton, as the true. Heidegger understands this chapter to be the culmination of Aristotle's teaching in Theta and as the completion of the discussion of truth in Epsilon IV. In his view, Aristotelian scholars who have questioned or dismissed the significance of Theta X, such as Schwegler and Jaeger most notably, are simply displaying the modern habit of thinking that truth has nothing to do with being and is to be regarded only as an epistemological or logical phenomenon. But Heidegger calls Theta X the keystone book of Theta, which is itself the center of the entire metaphysics, his words. And he elaborates on how in this chapter Aristotle speaks of the being as true, the on hos alethes, as what is most proper, kyriototon, to the being. In other words, for Aristotle, the primary and proper locus of truth is the being as manifestive, as showing itself as it is. This is precisely the Aristotelian insight and ancient Greek insight and experience more generally that Heidegger thought was forgotten thereafter in the metaphysical tradition, including in the Middle Ages. In an earlier lecture course during the winter semester of 1926-27, he had paid close attention to Aquinas' discussion of truth in De Veritate, and especially De Veritate 1, questions 1 and 2. And as we are well aware, Aquinas understands Aristotle to maintain that the locus of truth is in thought, or more precisely, in the judgment that composes and divides. But more to the point, Aquinas asserts that, strictly speaking, being is true only insofar as being is brought into relation with thought, with the intellect, human and divine. 
Therefore, as Aquinas states in his Respondeo in 1.1, being may be said to be manifestative, manifestativum, or shown, ostentatur, only as the consequence of truth, the effectum consequentum, the effect following upon truth. In other words, manifestatio, manifestation, and ostentatio, a showing or display, do not belong to being itself, but only to being insofar as it is declared or displayed in the judgment. And accordingly, in the first reply, Aquinas refuses the apparent sense and force of Augustine's words that, quote, the true is that which is, virum est id quod est, and proposes that Augustine was not identifying truth with the act of being, the actum essendi, but rather was referring to being as the foundation, the fundamentum of truth, and that truth properly resides only in the judgment. For Heidegger then, what was regrettably lost from view in Aquinas' philosophical account is the Greek experience of being as emergence, as arising, as showing itself, as displaying and declaring itself, as manifestation, as truth, being as aletheia. And of course, this forgottenness became more acute in Descartes' thinking, which rendered things as static objects for a subject. And in the subsequent unfolding of the modern philosophy of consciousness, in which things took on the character of mere mental objects or entities. And for Heidegger, Husserl's treatment of the things themselves, no matter his teacher's important breakthrough, nonetheless retained this modern subjectist philosophical coloring. So let me cite one other text in this regard, because I think it's quite fascinating. The philosophical relationship between Heidegger and Husserl, all other things aside, the philosophical relationship is always fascinating. In an observation that he made much later in his thinking, in 1965, most students of Heidegger's work are familiar with his 1964 address, The End of Philosophy and the Task of Thinking, which appears in the Basic Writings volume. But not long afterwards, he delivered a similar address, this time on the occasion of a birthday celebration for the Swiss psychiatrist Ludwig Binswanger. This talk was later published in 1968 in a Japanese translation and not until 1984 in German under the title On the Question Concerning the Determination of the Matter for Thinking and a complete English translation by my co-translator Marie Goebel and I has only recently appeared in the journal Epoche. Now, in some respects, I consider this address to be a more substantive and significant statement of his later thinking than the slightly earlier and much better known lecture. But to the point, Heidegger makes an observation that restates and reaffirms in yet one more way his long-standing position, the position that I have been laying out here, that it is the manifestness, the truth of the being, first brought to light by the ancient Greeks that must again command our attention so that we may break through the immanentism of the modern philosophy of consciousness. So he invites us to think back to Homer, and th this is text two. He writes, we may recall a scene during the homecoming of Odysseus. With the departure of Eumaeus, Athena appears in the form of a beautiful young woman. The goddess appears to Odysseus, but his son Telemachus does not see her, and the poet says, Ugarpos pantasi theoi phanontai enarges. This is from the Odyssey, book 16. 
For the gods do not appear to everyone in our case. This word is usually translated as visible. Yet Argos means gleaming. What gleams shines forth from itself. What shines forth thus presences forth from itself. Odysseus and Telemachus see the same woman, but Odysseus perceives the presencing of the goddess. Later, the Romans translated Enargea, the shining forth from itself, with Evidentia. Evidere means to become visible to someone. Evidence is thought in terms of the human being as the one who sees. In contrast, Enargea is a feature of presencing things themselves. Now the complaint here is a familiar one to those acquainted with Heidegger's thinking. The later Greek and Roman thinkers subtly shifted the philosophical focus away from being toward the human being as perceiver and knower. And it was Descartes who decisively moved the human subject as the ego cogito to the center of philosophical reflection. But in Heidegger's critical remark on evidence, evidence, the German word, we also hear once again, I think, a distancing from Husserl's position. Evidence, the principle of evidence, evidencing the truth, this is the language of Husserl's phenomenological project that for Heidegger revealed his teacher's inability to break free and clear of the ego subjectism of the Cartesian tradition of thinking. In other words, Husserl's call to return to the things themselves was a promise unfulfilled or at least only partially fulfilled. What remained of preeminent importance to Husserl was a consideration of the subjective or apophantic pole of the presentation of things. And what remained unarticulated and unaccounted for and certainly unappreciated as such was the gleaming of the being itself, the truth of the being itself. And to this, I would add in passing that in one of the few instances where Heidegger mentions Wittgenstein, he levels a similar but even harsher criticism. In Lathor in 1969, he characterizes Wittgenstein's first proposition from the Tractatus, the real is what is the case. That's how Heidegger rendered it. As, and these are Heidegger's words, a tr truly and eerie statement. The German here is gespenstischer, and I think eerie is adequate to, to translate that. Truly an eerie statement. He understands Wittgenstein's proposition to mean that a being is no more than, quote, that which comes under a determination is fixed in meaning, the determinable, unquote. And such a formulation for Heidegger is an eerie testament to how utterly and profoundly removed our contemporary philosophical thinking about beings is from the Greek experience of beings, as he puts it, leaping into view as ta phenomena, as ta aletheia, as what shows itself from itself, the presencing, the manifest, the true. Thus, let me pick up the thread of the narrative that I'm unfolding here. Heidegger had a very early insight into the truth of the being. And it is this insight, I propose, that moved him and guided him along his path of thinking during the 1920s into the famous turn in his thinking, Die Kera, after being in time, and then through the turn to his reformulation of the core matter as the truth of being in the 1930s. <clears throat> the expression, the truth of being, thus made explicit, 
what was implicit or liminal in his earlier phrase, the meaning of being, namely that the focal point of his thinking was, again in his own words, the manifestness of being and its relation to the human being. That's from 1946. In fact, to make this focus as sharp and pointed as possible, in a lecture course from 1941, he pushed his own hermeneutic phenomenological perspective to the very limit and went so far as to say this, quote, truth is independent, and he puts that in quotation marks because he doesn't mean that in the older traditional metaphysical way. I mean, he's still, he's stretching the limit of the hermeneutic phenomenological perspective. So he's willing to use the word independent, but qualifiedly. Truth is independent of the human being, since truth means the essencing of what is true in the sense of unconcealment. In the subjectivist perspective, he continues, Truth is dependent on the human being and caused, brought about, made, produced. But the human being is dependent on the truth if truth is properly understood as the lighting or the clearing of being as being's essence. Since to depend means to be determined and thoroughly attuned in essence, but not caused. Unquote. Now, in 1956, in a lecture course on the principle of ground, Heidegger put it more simply, quote, for we are never the ones who we are apart from the claim of being, unquote. And in Lethor in 1969, he gave clear testimony to the inner development of his thinking. And here, I refer to text three, on the sheet that you have. <clears throat> Here is Heidegger saying that the thinking that proceeds from being in time, in that it gives up the phrase meaning of being in favor of truth of being, henceforth emphasizes the openness of being itself rather than the openness of Dasein in regard to the openness of being. This signifies the turn in which thinking always more decisively turns to being as being. Now, of course, it is true that for Heidegger, Dasein is always the shepherd of being, the guardian of being, that is, he always reminds us that our access to being is only through our Dasein. And for this reason, it is fair to say that Heidegger's thinking remained phenomenological to the end. But Heidegger's enrichment of phenomenology lay precisely in his giving a full accounting of the claim of being on the human being the being of the da, the being of the there. So Heidegger's original and sustaining concern was with being as manifestation, as shining forth, as finest thigh, the spontaneous and ungrounded temporal flow of what appears, beyond which there can be no phenomenological seeing. And we might recall in this respect Heidegger's fondness for quoting Angelus Silesius's poetic line that, quote, the rose is without why, it blooms because it blooms, unquote. And over the years, guided especially by Aristotle's insight into the kinetic character of things, he unfolded his understanding of being itself, sein selbst, which is a technical term in Heidegger. I think many people are, are a labor under the misconception that Heidegger wasn't a very careful or systematic thinker. Now, perhaps systematic is too strong, but he's extremely careful with his language. And <clears throat> being itself, being as such, being as being, these are technical terms in Heidegger's work. 
and they mean the same thing each time. And there's a clear distinction that he makes between being itself and beingness, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. But I think Heidegger's language is very, very careful, very, very precise, even as it is also poetic. So being itself, sein selbst, this is the fundamental unifying and originary meaning of being that he was always after. And being itself is this being process, as Bill Richardson and some others have called it. I prefer to call it the being way. Wherein and whereby beings emerge, linger in their full look or presence, the ados that Plato speaks of, wane and pass away. Yet as he saw it, Plato, and particularly Aristotle, remained close to this originary experience of being. In other words, the full look, the eidos, or morphe, that Plato and Aristotle determined to be the ontos on, the really real, represented only a separating out and privileging of this one aspect of the whole arc of the presencing that is being itself. Consequently, for Heidegger, the temporal spatial emerging of beings in their beingness was still at least in the background of Plato's and Aristotle's proto-phenomenological thinking. Unlike in later metaphysical thinking, in which the variations on the formula being itself equals essence, or in Heidegger's language, constant presence, simply became commonplace. Now, if the question is whether Heidegger himself withdrew or abandoned the name being in speaking about his core concern, and this has been raised by some Heidegger scholars recently, and I think that the textual evidence is compelling and convincing that he did not. And if we hew close to this question, then I think that we uncover this engaging story of how Heidegger struggled mightily from beginning to end to retain the name of being while distinguishing it from metaphysical beingness. That's Heidegger's word, um, beingness, zion, height. Uh, in order to distinguish it from the being way that he's trying to make manifest, to bring into view. And I try to work this out in uh, the book in, in a greater detail and depth. But <clears throat> his perseverance in this effort is simply remarkable, really and a measure of how important it remained to him to safeguard the originary word of Western philosophical thinking, being, right to the very end of his lifetime of thinking. And, and I think this is awfully disappointing to a lot of uh, postmodern thinkers, right, who, who would like to say that Heidegger abandoned this name, being. You hear this all the time, but there is simply no textual evidence uh, to uh, support that, that view. For Heidegger, there is no beyond being, only a beyond beingness. And this expression, beyond being, uh, you know, Levinas talks about this, other uh, French thinkers in the so-called French theological turn, you hear a great deal about Heidegger moving beyond being. Well, no, not at all. Heidegger certainly wanted to move beyond beingness, but not beyond being. In fact, this is how he read Plato's well-known phrase, epikena tesousias, from Book 7 of the Republic. That is, for Heidegger, Plato was pointing beyond the ideas, beyond beingness, to a realm that enables and empowers the ideas in the first place, a realm that Heidegger identified as being itself, this temporal, spatial 
being way. But of course, this said, Heidegger also enjoyed the Spielraum, this, this free play or leeway of a thinker to name the or phenomenon that he had in view in a multitude of different ways. The many names that he put into play from the ancient Greek words aletheia, phusis, logos, to his own terms, erheignis, lichtung, gegnet, es gibt. All attempt to say and show with varying emphases the several dimensions of the one fundamental matter, what he properly named, again, being Zion with the Y, you may be familiar with that, especially in his work of the 30s, early 40s. Being with a Y, we'll translate it, being itself, being as such, being as being. All technical words for Heidegger. Saying, the German Sagen, is ultimately a showing, Zeigen, but it is also a playing. And Heidegger reveled in this play of saying and naming. And indeed, we might surmise on those very afternoons when he hosted visitors, such as Richardson and Frings, and he gazed out the window of his study and turned over in his thoughts how he might say it yet one more time. Our discussion today cannot be complete without a few clarifying remarks on two of Heidegger's terms of art, Ereignis and Lichtung. As I mentioned earlier, he employed the term Ereignis very early on in his 1919 lecture course, and in a few places thereafter. But by his own testimony, it was in the years 1936 to 38 during which he composed the private manuscript that we know as Beiträge to a Philosophie from Ereignis, Contributions to Philosophy from Ereignis, that he became intensely concerned with working out this notion new, specifically in historical terms. Now, I would add that Heidegger never thought of this dense and cryptic private manuscript to be publishable and it was not published in the Gesamtausgabe, right, the collected works of Heidegger, during his lifetime, not until 1989, in fact. Now, in my view, since its publication, the Heidegger scholarship has tended to overstate the significance of this text and to overstate, in particular, the significance of the term Ereignis in his thinking. And this is something that I have tried to work out more carefully as well. Nonetheless, it was not until the late 1950s and early 1960s that Heidegger brought his notion of Ereignis into fuller public view. Yet his discussion of Ereignis in his later thought is much more serene than in Beiträge and the Beiträge-related reflections of the late 1930s, all of which are marked by a, a somewhat disturbing quasi-apocalyptic tone. This was a difficult decade for Heidegger. In his later statements, though, he no longer speaks of Ereignis in terms of the dramatic and even traumatic momentousness or eventfulness of history, but rather now he calls it the most gentle of laws that allows the gathering of each being into what it properly is and into a belonging with other beings, a characterization we might note and emphasize that is remarkably similar to his long-standing description of being as the primordial logos, and I would argue remarkably similar to his earliest <coughs> use of the word ereignis in the 1919 lecture course, which I mentioned earlier. The later Heidegger ultimately found in the word Ereignis a way of bringing forth in a particularly vivid way the manifold features of being itself. From the beginning of his path of thinking, he was concerned to ground, that's his own word, the beingness of the metaphysical tradition by making manifest being as time. 
temporal spatial way, the movement, the way in which, by which, through which beings emerge, abide in their full look, wane, and depart. The word eroticness brings the being way into view by virtue of the three fundamental resonances of the word itself. I mean, the word is a very, has a rich history and resonates very richly. So the three resonances help Heidegger get the being way into view. So first resonance, the event or happening that is the efflorescence and effulgence of beings coming in to two, the second sense, their own, here the eigen of ereignen, and thereby three, the third sense, coming out into full view, to Dasein. Here, ereignen related to eroignen, which literally means to come before the eyes, from the German word for I, Auge. So this eroignus of beings, this unfolding process, Heidegger referred to as the singulare tantum in the late 1950s. That is the singular as such, which no more than echoed his frequent characterization of being itself as the hen, that Greek word hen, das eine in the German, the one or as the singular one, das einzig eine. And of course, the singular unfolding of beings is finite and negatived. But just in case this might be overlooked, he sometimes had recourse to pair ereignis with the word entigness as a reminder. Nonetheless, in the later work, ereignis conveys the simple and quiet but also profound and astonishing coming to pass of all things, such as the tree coming into bloom suddenly, or so it seems. I'd like to add a comment on his well-known but often misread 1962 lecture, Time and Being, Zeit und Sein. Nearing the end of the lecture, Heidegger states, the sole purpose of this lecture is to bring into view being itself as eroticness. This one line would certainly be decisive and definitive were it not that he does not helpfully clarify his conclusion here. He immediately shifts to a consideration of how this is not to be thought. That is, he warns that the as in this statement is especially treacherous because the metaphysical habit of thinking reflexively construes what follows the as to be only a mode of being. So he observes that if his statement is considered in this more traditional manner, eroticness would be no more than a subset of being and therefore subordinated to being as the main concept. And he emphasizes that this is certainly not his meaning. So he, he says, this traditional thinking, this traditional metaphysical thinking simply misses the fundamental matter he wants to speak about in talking about eroticness. Uh, but even though this may be the case, he doesn't offer no careful elucidation of how we are to understand then being itself as eroticness. Although it may be apparent enough that what he has in mind here is that being itself as a rightness names the same, and that is the giving of these epical or historical renderings of being, qua beingness. Yet more to the point, he does not directly address the apparent tension in the lecture between two claims. On the one hand, he states throughout that eroticness gives Dasein, gives Dasein, es gibt sein. But on the other hand, he concludes with the indication that the whole point of the lecture is precisely to bring into view being itself as eroticness. Now, the problem here lies with his uncertain use of the word Dasein, being. Now, Heidegger could be very, very precise and very, very careful, as, as I will say here in a moment, but but we have to admit that, especially in the later work, 
uh, there is a difficulty in reading many of the text because he often leaves the reader uncertain about the meaning of Zion, of being. And in certain contexts, it can be confusing and misleading. And here's a, a particular example of it in this lecture. Uh, but even in this lecture, Heidegger is very careful with his use of the name Zion Selbst, being itself. Being itself, uh, throughout his work, he's very, very careful in reserving this name for the fundamental matter for thought. So in time and being, we find that he does not state that eroticness gives or grants being itself. In fact, as far as I can determine, there is no place in any of Heidegger's texts early, middle, or late, where he allows that Ereignis gives being itself. Nowhere, in other words, where he uses the phrase es gibt sein selbst. Therefore, if we sort out the language of the lecture, then we can make better sense of his fundamental position. Ereignis, as es gibt, gives, grants, allows, enables, beingness, but eroticness and being itself the same. Das selbe. That's, a, that's a, uh, a favorite Heideggerian rhetorical turn where he says they're the same, not identical in a formal logical sense, because each term is saying something slightly different or maybe emphasizing something just a little bit different, but they are the same, das selbe. Uh, Eroticness and being itself. So carefully considered then, the lecture Time and Being does not reveal any departure in his thinking at all, but rather only a reformulation of the fundamental matter for thought in terms of eroticness as a gift. In fact, I suggest that this formulation itself may be regarded as a retrieval and restatement of his discussion of the lived experience of the es gibt. Remember, way back at the beginning of the talk, he uses this in section, sections 13 and 14 of that 1919 lecture course. But the key point is that the task for thinking, called for in time and being, this rather well-known lecture of 1962, remained what it had always been, namely to get into view what earlier Western philosophical thinking simply could not, the pure appropriating, putting into place, giving, granting, letting of what appears. Now, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, am I approaching the, the, the limit? Getting near. <laughs> well, good, good. I wanted to, I, I, I will summarize this, this next section here, really, which is uh, another term of art of Heidegger's, Lichtung. Um, let me just write that on the board. This term is used um, very often, but I think with very little understanding. And I think in particular, even in the Heidegger scholarship, there's this tendency to want to identify Lichtung with Dasein, again, with Dasein's disclosedness. And what I wanted to uh, simply leave you with here this afternoon is that uh, I simply do not think that that position can be supported by the texts. Granted, in Being in Time, Heidegger says something, something like that in section 28, but by 1946, Heidegger was very clear that that kind of reading of Die Lichtung, the clearing, the lighting, the clearing, depends on the period in Heidegger's thinking. Early on, he, he prefers to translated more in terms of the lighting, playing on Licht, um, later on more clearly as a spatial clearing. 
But by 1946, Heidegger is very, very clear that uh, identifying the clearing with Dasein's disclosedness is, is untenable. Uh, and in the letter on humanism, he says it very emphatically, but delictum itself is being. And he says it again here, if you just look at text four there on the, <coughs> on your handout, Very quickly, he says, thus it may be appropriate at this time to indicate at least broadly the clearing as the distinctive matter for another thinking. This is called for because four decades ago, the hermeneutic analytic of Dasein spoke about the clearing with the aim of unfolding the question of being and being in time. Yet it required a decades long walk along those forest paths that lead only so far the Holzwege to realize that the sentence in being in time, the Dasein of the human being is itself the clearing, perhaps surmised the matter of thinking, but in no way considered the matter adequately. That is, in no way posed the matter as a question that arrived at the matter. The Dasein is the clearing for presence as such, and yet Dasein is, at the same time, certainly not the clearing, insofar as the clearing is Dasein in the first place. That is, insofar as the clearing grants Dasein as such. And this is from 1965 now. And uh, I, I go on here just to talk a little bit about how this is a beautiful example of a retratatio of the, of the Augustinian kind. It's not a retraction as such, but it's Heidegger trying to uh, restate, rework, refocus what he considered to be always his position, and that is that um, Dasein as disclosing, as the clearing, uh, must always be kept in view and acknowledged, but the focal point of his thinking had always been the clearing itself, being itself, which clears or lets be Dasein in the first place. And in a conversation with Medard Boss in these same years, Heidegger talks about the clearing in the same language that he had talked about beer, uh, uh, being. So he talks about uh, the human being Dasein is the guardian of the clearing. Remember the guardian of the of being. Or he talks about Dasein is the shepherd of the clearing. Recall, of course, the shepherd of being. And finally, in 1973, again, three years before his death, text five that you have there, I think spells it out about as clearly as possible. This clearing, this free dimension is not the creation of the human being. It is not the human being. On the contrary, it is that which is assigned to him. Since it is addressed to him, it is that which is dispensed to him. So in Heidegger's universe of terms, being itself, ereignis, lichtung, the same, das selbe. Well, let me try to bring my thoughts to a conclusion here this afternoon. So being itself then is the unconcealing of beings, aletheia, the emerging, arising, appearing, shining forth of beings. Fusis, the laying out and gathering of beings, the primordial logos, but also the appropriating ereignis of beings and the clearing lichtung of beings. And here Heidegger is always trying to convey uh, not the presence of things, but the presencing of things. And he often refers to Aristotle's term kinesis, Heidegger's translation of that is bewegtheit, this, this movedness of all beings into and out of presence. And Heidegger meditated at length on Aristotle's uh, notion here of kinesis, and especially in his commentary on Aristotle's physics, beta 1. So let me bring it all to a conclusion, and then we can have or conversation. 
To sum up then, Heidegger's expression, the truth of being, says the same as being truths. Now this remains odd sounding and alien to many philosophers and even apparently to some more contemporary Heidegger scholars. But it is meaningful and compelling language nonetheless. It is Heidegger's distinctive way of calling us back to the experience of being as manifestive and indeed as festive uh, because at its heart, Heidegger's experience of being is celebratory. He's calling us back to the experience of things as they rise up and meet us and as we say in English, fill our senses to the experience of ourselves vibrating back from things, as Walt Whitman put it. The nearness and freshness and vividness of what is and the joy and thanksgiving that this calls forth in us. The dynamism of all things, both made and found, both of the exuberant city and of the serene wooded path, all things as they emerge, linger, and while in their appearance, but also wane, falter, and pass away. And there is for us to discern, too, that deep reserve inherent in the showing of things, that lethe dimension of aletheia that Heidegger spoke of so often, a reserve that keeps us unsure and unknowing and humbly reserved in our telling to ourselves and to others of what is. So with these observations taken together, we are in view again of the core matter of Heidegger's thinking. And we are reminded of the essential task that he left for us, to release ourselves to the things themselves, to their coming, abiding, and going so that we may be once again amazed and astonished and enthralled. Or again, in Walt Whitman's words, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Thank you very much. And so, yes? Do you think it's true that for Heidegger, um, without Dasein, there would be no lichtum, there would be no clearing? Well, y yes, I, that's a very good question, and that's, it, it, I think that is um, an issue in Heidegger's studies. Early on, he does tend to emphasize Dasein's role as the clearing. But again, by the 1940s, Heidegger's very clear that, yes, Dasein belongs to the clearing, but is not the clearing, is not the whole of the clearing, is not entirely the clearing. And he repeats that from the 40s right to his death in 1976, because he believes that he was misunderstood in being in time that even in being in time, he did not intend to say that Dasein is simply the clearing or that Dasein is the core matter of his thinking. But can you then also not say that things manifest themselves without the help of Dasein? Well, it, 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 that is a very, very interesting point. And, and I think that in this respect, Heidegger, as I say here, did remain phenomenological in, in that broadest sense and that our only access to being is through our Dasein. So uh, Dasein is an essential ingredient in thinking the clearing for us, but is not to be identified with the clearing, because that would be, again, to fall back into the kind of subjectism that he was uh, determined to counter and overcome from the very beginning, I think, of his thinking. 
at least from that 1919 uh, lecture course. So yes, we must think Dasein as part of the clearing, but not the entirety of the clearing. The focal point is that it is things that are manifest to Dasein that can then be made manifest by us. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Um, yes. I'm wondering if there are other places in being and time where you find such adumbrations of this, um, you know, uh, center stage for being as opposed to Dasein. One place that came to my mind, but I'm curious to know if, if you would think about it in those terms, would be uh, the idea that the horizon is primordial to the projection. You need a horizon in order to have the projection. You understand the projection in terms of there being a horizon. Um, something similar might be with the, the notion of the call, when um, the call calls does and we have the as group. And who is the caller? It's, it, com it comes from me, but it comes also from beyond me. So you might have like adumbrations of this idea that you know being has already laid some claim on does and it doesn't is there to give an account of himself in front of being. Or would, would you go that way? I, I think I think you say that very very well. And I would indeed agree with you. And I think that this is something that so concerned Heidegger in the later work that he, he kept uh, coming back to how he had been misread in Being in Time, that his project was not what it had uh, been taken to be by many, either those who thought of it as a simple continuation of Husserl's project or, or others who went even further. Well, I, I take him to be both. I take him to be uh, misconstrued, but I also take it that Heidegger was also deepening his own thinking about what he was really after there. That he himself understood that by adopting Husserl's phenomenological framework, he could only say so much. He could only say it in certain ways that would lead to those kinds of um, uh, misreadings or misinterpretations. So I think it's fair to say of uh, of those who would take a different view, that uh, sometimes perhaps Heidegger is not as, as fully forthcoming as he might, that indeed his own thinking deepened, his own insight into what he wanted to say early on was somewhat disguised, somewhat covered over by the kind of language he was uh, adopting in working within Husserl's classical phenomenological framework. Right, yes. Thank you, but thank you very much. I, I would agree with you completely. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, kind of about uh, the clarification in relation to some of the other talks I've heard. I mean, I do ancient philosophy, so I'm an amateur at, at Heidegger, but I appreciated your talk very much because that's, this is what, uh, what you were saying is, is what I kind of understand is some of Heidegger's uh, insights for us on ancient philosophy. Yes. <coughs> but um, some of the, the scholars would say that uh, Heidegger only began with ancient philosophy and, you know, as we see like an introduction to metaphysics, he talks about the, the shortcomings once you get very far beyond the pre-Socratics and that he actually kind of abandoned ancient philosophy and regarded it as just as as uh, limited as all the other periods of philosophy later on, but I don't see you saying that. And in fact, it seems somewhat connected to uh, the issue of, of how to understand being. I kind of uh, understood you to be talking more about the being of beings rather than being its 
yourself. Um, but what would you say about um, you know his attitude toward Asian culture? Well, I I I think Heidegger valorized ancient philosophy. What? He valorized it. I mean, he championed it. Uh, he, it, 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 it's the, uh, the, very, the very sources of his own thinking and, and his own insights, as he says repeatedly, and he keeps coming back to the Greek thinkers. And while he may be critical of Plato and Aristotle in places as representing a step away from what he understood to be the originary insights of the pre-Socratics, Nonetheless, it's a lifetime of meditation on Plato and Aristotle that he continues to um, bring forth. He continues to uh, work over and work through. And I, I think his, his principal criticism is that uh, in Plato and Aristotle, we begin to find a, a consolidation of an understanding of being in terms of constant presence, that the temporal dimension has fallen away. So when Heidegger uses the word being itself, it is the being way. It is a temporal, spatial, finite, emerging of beings, fusis, uh, which was translated as nature, um, natura by the Romans. So, his principal criticism is simply that, that, that somehow that, that the temporal dimension of being seems to have been, um, been lost from view in Plato and in Aristotle, but only to an extent, to a degree, because it's always there, he says. Nonetheless, it's in the background. <coughs> Uh, they did not lose that originary insight into the being way, being itself, being as such, being as being, those technical terms I was talking about. It wasn't lost entirely at all. So he has this tremendous respect for the Greek thinkers, for Plato and Aristotle uh, in particular. And so I think, unfortunately, for some Heidegger scholars, or unfortunately for those who have come after Heidegger in the postmodern movement, it's become it's become um, something of a, of a habit to simply um, utter these conclusions or these statements that Heidegger um, rejected Plato and Aristotle, who criticized them roundly or condemned them or or found them to be not philosophically interesting, or that we must move beyond them once and for all. There's nonsense. It's utter nonsense. It's not in Heidegger, and it's certainly not in uh, the, the uh, thoughtful way I would engage Heidegger's thinking. Yeah? Yes? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one has to do simply with Heidegger <coughs> and a small work that he wrote, and I don't remember the dating, and I haven't looked at it read it for many years, but it was on Plato's teaching on truth. Yes. And uh, there he is pretty hard on Plato, at least talking about the change that takes place in uh, the philosophical understanding of truth, uh, especially in Plato's Republic and the allegory of the cave. Yes. As uh, unhiddenness or unconcealedness on the one hand and correctness of vision right. on the other. And I was wondering how does that fit into uh, the text you've been citing? Well, I think that's, that's a very good way of, of asking that question because I think that's the text that most people are familiar with and that... Um, I couldn't hear it, Professor Wibble, I couldn't hear oh, oh, yes. Oh. Professor Wibble was referring to uh, Heidegger's text on Plato, which is normally translated as Plato's Doctrine of Truth, which was published in 1942. It was composed in 1940. However, what many people don't realize is that, that there are at least five or six versions of that that preceded the one that is well known, the one that is published in uh, the, the basic writings, or in Pathmarks, I think it's in Pathmarks. And, and I deal with a, a, a number, uh, all of the, the previous iterations of his criticism. 
And I think that last statement is perhaps the most critical. In the earlier statements, it is qualified in, in many ways. And so he, he, you often find him saying, no, no, Plato had a glimpse into this. The, the insight was still there. The epicanetes will see us. He understood that, that even beingness was not the final movement, that there was something beyond. And of course, he reads Plato to be retaining or recovering or sustaining this idea that being is this, this temporal, spatial emergence of beings. So he's very charitable, very generous to Plato in many other places. But in that particular text, and that's the text that most people know, yes, Heidegger does begin to um, state that in, in a more sharply critical way. And, and that's the text that many people then if, if they're simply familiar with that text, would, would perhaps take away uh, that Heidegger had a more critical stance toward Plato. But I, I don't think it's borne out by the, by the body of work or, or the body of Heidegger's reflections on Plato. Uh, so are you saying then that he retracted that view? Well, or not? I guess in the qualified sense. Yeah. Uh, no, I think, I think he always had a, a lover's quarrel with Plato. That on the one hand, um, w w we find here uh, so much that we can retrieve, so much that we can recover, so much that we can continue to, to uh, turn over for ourselves in philosophical thinking. But at the same time, he's troubled by the trajectory of Plato's thinking toward identifying being with this constant presence, this timelessness, this spacelessness, worldlessness. That is the Plato that he always did quarrel with. That is the Plato he always remained critical of. But that's not to say that he's not appreciative of the richer dimension of Plato's thinking, where he even finds some of the this, this originary thinking of being still in place, still there are clues, there are, there are these important instructive elements in Plato's thinking that uh, we can point to to show that, no, I mean, th this is a great thinker trying to work through very difficult philosophical problems. And uh, my other question uh, has to do simply with uh, Heidegger's uh, discussion of Aquinas' uh, De Veritate, right. question one. <coughs> and uh, I guess there, uh, I'm quite fascinated by that as to how thoroughly he had, or how carefully he read Aquinas uh, on that very text, because uh, it's quite complicated. Aquinas there, as you know, I don't want to go through the whole text because, but he's trying to explain how it's possible then uh, for being to be divided, because it can't uh, be divided by itself. Or it can't be divided by something outside itself. It's not a genus. It can't be divided as a genus is by differences, which would be what he probably says. But, uh, so he says it can be divided from within by certain modes. And then he has special modes, and these would be the categories of the predicaments, and then general modes, and those are the transcendentalists. And of course, then one of those transcendentalists is the property of and that's what, of course, he was talking about. But I, what I'm interested in is because for Aquinas, what is prime, the primary there among the transcendentals is being. And then as he gets to down to the relative transcendentals, and that would be the true and the good, then as you bring about, and it's certainly either for you, Aquinas is saying when we consider being in relationship to the soul, and especially to the intellect, then we refer to it as true. Right. But uh, he's, Thomas has two senses of truth, even in that discussion. So he's talking about the truth found in being as a property of being. So that's at present wherever be a being is found. And it's very clear there's no real distinction between truth and being when we take it in that particular sense. And it's that truth, which we could today call intelligibility, which enables then for us to arrive truth in the mind or truth in the intellect. 
And if we look at it from, let's say, the European philosophical <coughs> order, the order of discovery, we can make those distinctions without bringing in God or relationship to God, as far as, uh, as, far as I would read Thomas. Nevertheless, in the order of being, ultimately, for a full account of truth, as you brought out there, Aquinas argues that nevertheless, then, that truth of being, enjoyed then by every particular being, ultimately rests upon uh, its, if you like, that equation, though that's not the word to use it there, well, it does, it corresponds to the divine idea, in other words, to God's knowledge of that truth. I think it's important, though, to note that for Aquinas, the divine idea is God's understanding of his own being. And as a consequence, then, the divine idea is simply the way in which God understands himself as indicated by the creature. So the divine idea is ultimately grounded in and identical to the divine being. So that's where the relationship is ultimately directed. But now the question arises: well, in the definition of truth, and he can, comes up with several different proposed definitions, including the one you mentioned by Augustine and another by Avicenna, and then finally this one which brings truth in as an adequation between what is in the intellect and what is in the thing, and that's what we usually call logical truth. And he does say, and you used the word correctly, he does say in the past that truth appropriate, properly speaking, strictly speaking, is found in the intellect. In right. The on the other hand, he doesn't deny, in fact, he asserts that truth is also found when we speak broadly in being itself. And that's a very important point. Well, I, 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 and, and of course, I, I um, would. Uh, I agree with you that a much more careful uh, look at the text would be in order. But I think, I, I, l let me put it this way and see if you would agree with me here, that I think what Heidegger is trying to highlight, though, is that uh, Aquinas wishes to say that we cannot speak of truth apart from an intellect, human or divine. So he doesn't quite see Aquinas saying that truth is a property of being. He doesn't see that, at least in those texts. He doesn't say that there. And that's what I think he's focusing on. Well, uh, I think there he's mistaken. <laughs> oh, that Heidegger is mistaken? Yes. Aquinas does say that truth is intrinsically present in being. But only as thought by God, right? But, but that's the thing. Ultimately, the truth that, let's put it this way, the being that the creature enjoys, according to Aquinas, uh, exists only insofar as it is created by God. Right. And then when we refer, for instance, to the truth of the being, well, that being is ontologically true because it's created by God to correspond to an idea in the divine mind, which is identical with the divine essence. So even that divine idea is grounded in the divine being. So uh, the problem is, he does, when he asks, is truth appropriate, you know, using that particular term, therefore present in, in being or in the intellect, he says in the intellect, when we speak most strictly, most properly. Right, right, right. But he also says that speaking broadly, appropriate, is present in being. It's found wherever being itself is found. Now, I might say that you're not the, uh, uh, Heidegger's not the only one to read Thomas, as, uh, as you find Heidegger reading him, apparently. I can think of one well-known to mystic scholar today uh, who recently wrote an article saying that Thomas abandoned that position, not in the De Veritate, but in the Summa Theologiae. Uh, that was Father Lawrence, Lawrence Dubon, who's a very well-known to mystic scholar. Uh, but he was then corrected, I think, and rightly so, by, I would say, the world's leading authority on the transcendentals in Aquinas, named John Erickson, who is a Dutch scholar, but a very, he's written a book on the transcendentals, actually, and uh, has a long section on truth. Uh, so it is a, it's a very subtle point, but a very important point. Yes, no, I, I would agree, and of course, I'm, uh, I, I'm certainly not saying that Heidegger necessarily read uh, the text correctly, um, but it is how he read the text. And I think, and, and, and maybe, maybe I, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I, I think that 
I'm not sure that Heidegger is entirely simply wrong on this. I mean, it, it, it's maybe something that would need more nuance. Well, that's why I don't have the full text. Yes, I right, like right. Yes. To, to my point, you know, yeah. Yes. In being. Yes. And there's a great difference, I think, between Zion, of course, and Thomistic essay. That's another issue. Yes. Yes, it is. And uh, as far as I know, Heidegger doesn't pick up that notion of essay. Well, I think he does, but I think he criticizes it only because it is always related to essence. And so it always has that sense of constant presence. And, and so he, he does take account of it, but he doesn't find it as... Um, very helpful in his own elucidation of what he understands by being itself as the being way. So, but um, I, I, I think that this is an important dialogue to I continue think, to have. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever heard of a person who philosophized, he was on our faculty for many years, named Thomas Cooper. Yes, I, yes, I did. Or did you know him? I did not know him, but I did certainly know him. Well, he was there, of course, for him. many years, and he was a specialist in Aquinas, but he had also written, he knew Heidegger inside and out very, very well, and we talked quite a bit about Heidegger's conception of truth, and uh, he gave a rather simple explanation, and I've never forgotten it. He said he felt that Heidegger uh, actually wanted to have truth as being without God. Well, I, would you agree with that? Well, I, I just don't think that Heidegger... Um, makes any claim about God at all. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't bring him into the account. Exactly. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that he's closed the matter at all, and I think that that's another uh, misreading of Heidegger. It's an unfortunate misreading of Heidegger. He doesn't close the matter at all. He says that as far as we can consider this phenomenologically or hermeneutically phenomenologically, it remains an open question, uh, but we cannot see past the being way. Uh, th this temporal spatial emergence of being. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Professor Whipple. Y yes, yes, sir. Um, one thing you started t touching on at the end is the issue of covering up or concealment as being a kind of equally important part of being. Mm -hmm. um, like it always goes together with unconcealment. Pusis is the kind of restless struggle out of unconcealment. Um, and later on, he even says that freedom is shimmering veil that covers up as well as revealing itself as being the kind of thing that covers up in the clearing. Now I'm just wondering, kind of one of the more elusive expositions he gives of the, of the kind of dual nature of being as consumer and consumer is the, the stuff about Dasein and being in time, that it's grown out of the past, its future is cut short by death and the kind of indefinite moods that we have about those two parts of our lives or about our, about our existence. Um, Kind of reveal something special about being, or that's a, a direct means by which we start to understand being. And I was wondering, how in the later, in his later writings, did he kind of eclipse that understanding of the dual nature of being as consumer and unconsumer by moving past the, the description of Dasein's existence? Does that make sense? Sorry, that's a little rambling at the no, end. No, 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 that, that's, that's quite all right. Uh, I, I don't think he moves past it. I, I think he always emphasizes that <clears throat> there's this dimension of lethe to aletheia, so this dimension of, of concealment, as you say, to the showing of things. Um, I, I would perhaps um, be uh, less inclined to refer to that as the dual nature of being, because that gets us into all sorts of other problems that oh, yeah. we don't need. But, but, that, but that being itself as aletheia is the showing of beings which always um, r retains a reserve, this deep reserve he's always talking about. So uh, it is not a, a, a transparent showing. Right. I guess, do you think that he, we understand that better in the later writings or in the earlier stuff when, like when we have a concrete uh, kind of ripping of Dasein by, that, by both being in the truth and being in the end? Like where, yeah, where's the, the point Paul gets in the reading? Well, I think, I think he says it in different ways over the course of his own lifetime of thinking. And I think if, if you find it more in terms of um, Dasein's facticity and thrownness uh, in being in time, I think that's, that's fair enough. Although the section in truth and section 44 in being in time, um, he does come back to talking about this Lethe dimension 
of Alethea. But then he continues to restate it throughout his lifetime of thinking in, in all sorts of different ways, poetic and philosophical. But I think you're absolutely right, and that was what I wanted to end with there, that it is always a dimension of Heidegger's thinking which keeps us from a kind of bold claim that we simply have the truth of the being or that we have the truth of being itself as manifestness, right? It's a qualification on that manifestness, right? right yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yes, Holger. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Richard. I, ha I have two questions as well. So one concerns Heidegger's way of thinking and the relation between his early Freiburg lecture, so 1919 till 23, being in time and his, his later philosophy. Um, and then two, in two interesting questions here. One is, uh, it is very puzzling and interesting, and, and many scholars commented on this when those volumes came out in the 1919 lecture course and, and later lecture courses, that they realized, well, what we took, basically some of the later Heidegger's basic ideas, they're already there. They were in the world worlds and the ideas and this language. The interesting question is, what is happening then on the way to being in time? That's, that seems to be very different. That seems to speak a different language as well. That, and, and Heidegger himself criticized being in time as still being indebted to a certain kind of subjectivism yes. in his reading and yes. criticism, or in his rereading of uh, being in time. Or at least he said, well, being in time has an ambiguous character with respect to this. So the interesting thing is, what's happening from here to being in time? And then if I, if I look at this, another interesting question is, um, you're completely right. The later Heidegger would always emphasize, emphasize the influence of Brentano, and that basically the question of being was the big overarching question. If you read the early Freiburg lectures, it is there, but it's not as prominent as you would expect it to be. Yes. When he's talking about hermeneutics, objectivity, practical life, the historical, uh, but the sort of fundamental ontological question you, becomes more prominent in the sort of, uh, in the course of the 1920s. Um, so there's something interesting here as well. I mean, do you think he's construing a certain narrative here, or constructing a certain narrative against the evidence? He didn't want these lectures to be published. Yes, in, right. To begin with. Yes. So, so how do you explain these two phenomena? You know, a certain loss on the way of being in time, or is it a loss, or, or what? And then is the question of being so dominant in the early 1920s? Well, I, I think that that's a very a difficult question, right, to, to answer. It, it, it's related to the question that, that you were asking. Um, it, it seems clear to me that, that Heidegger, at least beginning in the 1940s, did begin to construct a certain narrative for himself about what he was always concerned about. And from that point of view, it would seem that some of these early uh, lecture courses, some, some of this early language was somewhat disturbing to him, somewhat, uh, he was somewhat uncomfortable with it because it did appear that he had uh, adopted this more narrowly phenomenological view, um, that he was working within uh, Husserl's phenomenological framework, and in that 1946 piece, as I said, he's, he's quite decisive, he's quite emphatic. Of course, I was not. I was, from the very beginning, not working within that framework, and he complains bitterly, uh, why is it that people keep reading me as, why, why do people keep reading even being in time as a kind of phenomenology of natural consciousness? He said, I'm not doing any such thing. Uh, this, is, this was not my project. Now, we could ask the question, is he being entirely fair to the texts? Is he being entirely forthcoming about his own development? Uh, as a thinker? I, I think these are legitimate questions. But for me, as I read the Heidegger that emerges around 1940, I think what's interesting to me is to go back and to try to discern, oh, what, what is he talking about? You know, what are the clues in this early work from 1919 
into being in time. What are the clues that would lead us to agree with Heidegger that that was not his project, that was not his primary concern, that it was always with being, qua manifestness. And so I think if we look at it like that, as I'm trying to do, I think certain things begin to spring forth in, let's say, the 1919 uh, electric course, and even in being in time. But, but I think, Holger, you're, you're right. There is, there is a, a rather significant change in tone, too, in being in time, and then into uh, the 1930s. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I point out in, in, the, in the book that most people associate Heidegger with this mood of angst. But Heidegger spent very little time talking about this, maybe from 1926 to 1930. It, it plays a major role in his thinking, but after that, that, that mood is not privileged by Heidegger ever again. And he moves entirely away from it to astonishment, to wonder, to awe, what I was emphasizing here at the end of the paper. So many people are, are fixed on this Heidegger who has this rather tragic vision of life. And we're all filled with this uh, angst before existence. Uh, th this is a very small part of Heidegger's uh, work and thinking, and I don't think a significant part. And I might be, you know, I might certainly be in the minority in terms of postmodern thinkers who want to play that up for all it's worth, you know, to, to keep us trembling in our existence. There's no doubt there's maybe a, an element of that, but it is certainly, I think you, you'd be hard pressed to say that that's the dominant theme or mood that Heidegger um, speaks about as a philosopher over the course of his entire philosophical work. Well, I, that's the best I can do at the moment, Holger. Okay. But we can talk more about it. Yes? It does bring up the question of boredom later on, right? So you could think that <laughs> uh, what he's doing is not that, um, well, the way in which he brings boredom towards the end of his career and the way in which he talks about boredom as a mood is very different. <laughs> to light the, the positivity in boredom, right? And the positivity in a certain kind of boredom. So you could probably go back to anxiety in being and time and reveal what is actually positive about that and that it's not like a gloomy uh, mood, but that it actually has this kind of positive ego. So if you would want to kind of continue the uh, story of continuity in a positive light and, and read something um, in the earlier one, you could do it with boredom. It, yes, except that I think that <clears throat> in the later work, uh, the moods of angst or boredom, these become moods that are distinctive of the present age. See, they're no longer constitutive of Dasein, of the human being, as he spoke about that in Being in Time and, and in the 20s. He begins to talk about these more negative moods as somehow ingredient to the age of technology, and, and that becomes part of his critique of the age of technology. But he no longer says that these moods are constitutive of Das. I know, in fact, he says, if we can move beyond right, this kind of enframing, Das Gestell, if we can move beyond this technological enframing, we can recover a kind of bodenständigkeit rootedness in being. In being, see, I think that's what I would emphasize. Uh, I know uh, Ted Kiesel would, would, would perhaps not go that far because he still wants to talk about rootedness in, in a political community or in a cultural community, but I think it's, it's far richer than that in Heidegger. It's a rootedness in being, in the being way. And this is a recovery of this astonishment, awe, uh, amazement, uh, a very positive celebratory mood for the later Heidegger. So I think that would be the key difference. Yeah, yes.
Do we have time for that one sure. question, John? Well, my question was going back to truth. Um, and first, just for my understanding, were you saying that, um, this might have been in your response to Monsignor Whipple, were you, were you saying that what Heidegger wanted to reject in Aquinas was that truth had to imply a relation to an intellect? Yes. Yes. So yes. for Heidegger, is there any uh, analogy in truth? I mean, it, when he says being truths, is that meaning of truth analogous to truth of a proposition? Or are these purely equivocal? Well, well, Heidegger uh, distinguishes, he, he thinks in, in some respect the tradition became dominated by the truth of correctness, propositional truth. So the first thing he wants to do is step back to something more fundamental or primordial. He says, a truth of disclosure. That Dasein discloses what shows itself from itself. And that's a more fundamental kind of truth from what he calls the more derivative understanding of truth as propositional. Truth is correctness, the truth that belongs properly in the, in the judgment. So on the side of Dasein, right, he, go, he, he refers to alathuein, that is, the ways in which Dasein discloses truth. And he wants to make that distinction and, and point to a more fundamental kind of truth, this truth of disclosure. But Dasein's disclosedness is itself dependent on the truth of being, being as it manifests itself as it is, shows itself from itself. So he wants to extend that word truth to speak about being. And his complaint is that he doesn't find it there in that text in De Veritate. He, he, he would like to affirm that being truths. And that becomes the leitmotif of his commentary there. OK, well, thank you very much. Thank Professor Rich. Thank you. Being truth is really a great way to begin and end and uh, pursue this series. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Thank Dr. you. Joshua. Thank you, Dean uh, McCarthy. Next week, uh, Professor Richard Bolt from uh, Xavier University, who is a defender of uh, Pythagoras, a translator. So. Yes, indeed. Good friend, too. It's nice to have you all together, and you could duke it out. Uh, that's <laughs> but, uh, and we're not going to duke it out. Rather, uh, I would have you uh, go out to the Lichtung, the clearing of our foyer for our reception. Uh, so, thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you, Holger. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, hello, Alan. <laughs>